really interesting element of this midterm election season is what you might call, for lack of a better word, the uh, passion gap or the intensity gap. You would know if she got a front page story. She would, she would come just come home, home and, and she would be like, yeah. I got a front page story. Guess who got a front page story? Yeah. And she wouldn't brag, but she would point it out. Yeah. Distinctly. She loved politics and she actually loved politicians. So she was not cynical about the political process. She knew everybody in Congress. She knew everybody. Um, in Washington. She'd known him for a long time. She'd sort of seen him come up through the political ranks. No matter the gender, people knew she was a tough, smart reporter who knew what she was talking about, and they knew better than to mess with her. In order to rise to the top as a national political correspondent in the New York Times, you have to be tough, and you have to be able to hang in there. There just weren't that many women who had been in that role before Robin came along. Robin knew how to ask questions, she knew how to listen for answers, she knew how to root out stories that nobody else heard and knew how to write. She had this uncanny way of kind of getting behind the talking points and finding out what these people really thought and what we could expect of them. Robin despised being beaten um, by other political reporters. I've never seen anyone hate more to have someone else see something that she might have not seen as quickly. And when you're the national political correspondent for the New York Times, you're under tremendous pressure from everybody uh, because they see you as sort of the referee and uh, your calls are really counted on to say what's important that day or that week. And I don't think Robin ever really missed a big trend or a big story. She wasn't just the political reporter who, who covered the personalities of politics. I thought she made sure that all of her stories were infused with the issues. She wasn't, she wasn't nervous about dealing with the complexities of health care or the economy. I would read her stories every morning and think, how did she make it so much clearer than I did? There's no one like her out there now for any publication um, writing about health care with the knowledge and understanding of uh, politics and policy that Robin had. She had a lot of interest, I think, in a lot of issues that particularly affect women. Um, she, for instance, I think brought a, a sensitivity and nuance to the abortion debate that you very rarely see. Senator Kennedy, again, probably said it best, that she was a reporter's reporter who cared deeply about the people and the issues she covered. I met Robin in uh, 1972 at Syracuse University. We were freshmen, and we became lifelong friends that year. Uh, first of all, she was the smartest person I'd ever met in my life, scary smart and uh, really, really funny. One of the first journalism stories that I remember that she wrote in freshman year was about prostitution. And so she went down there really late at night and she interviewed them for a couple hours. But I also remember she went back several times to get all her facts straight. And Robin was just always the one at the, at the front of the pack saying, yeah, we can do this. She, she sort of radiated you know, warmth and intelligence and and, and just someone you wanted to hang out with. We uh, met as competitors. Um, I called her up and invited her to lunch. And I was told afterwards that she went around with her friends and she quizzed them closely about what this was about. And they told her it was a date. The fact is there are a lot of choices you have to make if you're a woman. Robin decided she was going to be a whole person. She was going to be a wife, she was going to be a mother, and she was going to be excellent at her craft. And she pulled off all three. Her kids often came to the office with her. They knew what she did. They knew how hard she worked. There was always, like, press calls where she'd just be like, oh, I'll be five minutes. And, like, three hours later, she'd come back and be like, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. She got carried away. When I was a little kid, I didn't appreciate that she was interviewing all these famous people. But as I got older, I realized, oh, my God, my mom just sat and talk to John Kerry. When we got the diagnosis, we, we told the kids that mom had cancer and that we had the fight of our lives on our hands. And I think the kids right off said, okay, 
but you have to promise us that we would tell them uh, when we stopped winning and the cancer started. And we made good on it. I think at the beginning after her diagnosis, Robin attacked it very much as a reporter, trying to figure out what was going on here, what her options were. She wanted two things during that period. She wanted to spend quality time with her family. When she told me that she was gonna take the whole summer off, and she just said very calmly, it may be my last summer with my kids and with Peter. She also wanted to work. She worked as much as she could and she wrote page one stories, you know, when she was getting chemo. She was really strong through her illness. Part of it was that she really did take a lot of solace from her Catholic faith. Um, and part of it was that she just really believed journalism is a faith system of its own and she believed that this, she, this is what she was supposed to do and so she just just kept going as long as she could. Robin Toner, who was the first woman to be the national political correspondent of the New York Times, died early Friday at her home in Washington. She was 54. She was part of what was really the first generation of women reporters. So all the challenges beyond the journalistic challenges that go with being literally a pioneer. That was part of what Robin achieved. But to get everything right, to be first, to be right, to be accurate, and to be beloved by the people she covered and the people she worked alongside. It's hard to go to a political event and you look around and Robin Toner's not there. She, she was so much a part of it. I remember Robin saying as we would all talk about our dreams of what we were going to be in the future as you know, young women do, uh, she said, I'm going to be a reporter at the New York Times. I actually knew, yes, Robin was going to be a reporter at the New York Times. She let her byline be on stories. So this is just another byline. Syracuse University and the Newhouse School of Public Communications have launched a major fundraising drive for the Robin Toner Endowed Fund. The fund will underwrite programs in Robin's name designed to recognize and foster the kind of unbiased, fact-based political coverage that Robin so cherished and at which she so excelled. For information about how you can help, contact Lynn Vanderhoek at 315-443-9236 or email L-A-V-A-N-D-E-R at S-Y-R dot E-D-U. Or send your contribution to the Robin Toner Endowed Fund, Care of the Dean's Office, the Newhouse School, 215 University Place, Syracuse, New York, 13244. Your support of the Toner Fund will ensure that the life and works of this reporter's reporter remain a vital, visible example for both working journalists and Newhouse students who aspire to follow in Robin's footsteps.